Hi, uh, hello everyone. Thanks very much for joining this uh, webinar on um, digitalization of the immigration system. Um, we've got an hour and uh, a lot to cover, so we're going to crack on through. So we have three super speakers today. Um, Catherine Denyer, who's a managing practice development lawyer for immigration and global mobility team at Lewis Silkin. Um, Catherine's worked in immigration since 2004. And um, she previously worked here at Lexis, um, launching, developing, maintaining the module. Um, we also have Darren Stevenson, who is very kindly stepping in for John Vassiliou. As many of you know, John, John is currently heavily engaged in the Ukraine advice project, so he's had to step back. But we have a super replacement in Darren. Darren is a solicitor at Wigan LLP, worked at, previously worked at McGillan Co. He acted in, in the famous case of Baznet and Remain, which we all know well. Before that, he worked for uh, the, the UK border agency, as was he has a niche area of work in um, regulation and admission of vessel crew members serving in the UK waters. Um, and he's currently also a fee page ju judge for the first year tribunal. Finally, Luke, we all know as well, very well, head of policy and advocacy at the 3 million large campaign group representing the interests of EU citizens uh, in the UK after Brexit. He's a non-practicing solicitor and has worked in the migration sector for over a decade uh, with a particular expertise now obviously on the um, citizens' rights and the withdrawal agreement. So um, they are the speakers. We will today be speaking about digitalization and what is digitalization? I would define it as using digital technology to make application procedure, status and operation of the border at port internally and internally paperless. Um, increasing operational capability through online systems and early use of automated decision making and increasing the Home Office's own data resources. It's a massive deal. It's central to the Home Office's mission for the next few years. The Home Office has its own digital team, numerous IT projects on the go. It affects the way um, new routes go live or amended, as we're seeing at the moment with the Ukraine system. It's transformed immigration control at the border for cohorts of applicants, and it's led to constant change of processes and lack of certainty. I would say it's characterized as well by opacity. You often generally find out what's happening in relation to it um, randomly in government announcements or other issues, or when guidance documents suddenly appear, or even when IT publications give news of new tenders or tender wins for new projects. It's also, opacity is also a feature of commercial partners and the increased use of commercial partners in delivering and maintaining new systems. Another feature is um, a, a commercial partner use is the, op is the operational complexity as you have so many different people involved, both internally and for the user. There's a lot of positives in um, um, digitalization, as we all know, but also concerns in relation to data sharing, discrimination in terms of who can and cannot benefit from the systems and going further than that, a fear of a new Windrush. There's also a growing academic literature on it, which is very uh, interesting. The Public Law Project have been very involved, and I'd recommend the work of Joe Tomlinson at York University and Jack Maxwell, who've re recently written a book on this and various articles. We will be sending a source sheet, um, which has lots of the resources, both in the public domain and also the PSL uh, materials that we uh, publish that, that deal with these sorts of issues. Um, and yeah, so without further ado, first of all, we, um, I'm going to speak to Catherine. Catherine is going to be talking about various practical issues. We're going to jump straight in on the practical issues of digitalization. And so first, Catherine, in terms of the illegal working uh, aspect of uh, digitalization, we know that the Home Office is introducing a um, IDVT, Identity Document Validation Technology, from April this year to allow employers to check the right to work for British and Irish passport holders. What is your assessment of this development for employers and individuals? Um, well, I think that employers are going to be very happy to have this technology available because um, of hybrid and remote working solutions um, due to the pandemic having arisen. It is more difficult um, to get right to work checks done for people face to face nowadays. And um, one of the issues with right to work checks that are manual is that the HR person who is doing the check has to have the physical document in front of them. Um, they can do a video call with the individual, but they need to have the document. So the IDVT will get rid of that that requirement so it gets rid of the issues for document handling which are now more difficult um, post-pandemic um, but it will it's interesting that 
um, despite the trend for the Home Office having their own large team for IT projects and taking a lot of the technology projects in-house in recent years, for this they've decided to use third-party providers and those providers are going to be vetted under the um, Digital Identity and Attributes Trust framework with the, which the government has set up um, overall. So I think that will be good in the sense that those providers will be robustly vetted in terms of data protection. Um, but um, it also means that it is um, something that the Home Office is going to have to sort of control um, in the longer term rather than, than controlling it in-house. Um, I think employers are going to find that um, a bit of an issue in the sense that they're going to have to set up a commercial relationship with a third party provider and they're also going to have to pay a fee to use the service, whereas doing right to work checks up until now has been entirely free, whether it's doing a manual right to work check yourself or um, using the Home Office's online um, document check uh, or, or um, immigration status check procedures through View and Prove service, for example. Um, it's also only going to be a limited service to begin with, so it's only going to check the passports for British and Irish citizens, including Irish passport cards, but only ones that are valid, so you can't, can't use it for expired documents. Um, and it remains to be seen whether or not this technology will be rolled out to be able to cover other types of documents over time. Um, so I suppose ultimately, if employers start to get used to being able to use online checks or the IDVT service, it could be the case that people who want to rely on manual documents in the future could find that there is a bit of um, difficulty for them or discrimination if employers or um, accommodation providers, because this can be used for um, accommodation right to rent checks as well, if those um, employers and landlords think that it's easier to have somebody uh, that they can take on board who has got access to a sort of more secure means of verifying their right to work or right to rent. Um, so, you know, it could be a good development in a lot of ways, but I think it's not going to be without its issues, um, as with all of these things. Yeah, great. And then in terms of the, uh, the sponsorship roadmap, um that was announced and, and is due to be um, rolled out to the beginning of um, 2024. How does digitalization feature in the transformation of systems for, for sponsoring workers? Um, well, digitalization is absolutely key for the transformation of this. I mean, we already have a digital system for um, sponsor management, but it's very old and it's very clunky and it's been in need of replacement for quite some time and it's an old system that's been around since 2008. Um, so I think the Home Office's plans for this are quite ambitious. Um, it's broadly a three-stage process. So the first service that they're looking to roll out will be a service which will start to pre-populate the immigration application forms for sponsored workers um, taking information that's been plugged in from the certificate of sponsorship that's issued by a sponsor um, to a potential sponsored worker. So I think that will be a good thing in the sense that it will save time and reduce their scope for inconsistencies between the information on the COS and the information that is put in by the individual immigration applicant. Um, but it's not clear yet what will happen if somebody makes a mistake on the um, COS. So, you know, is, is that information going to be stuck in the immigration application and not able to be edited? Or um, will there be a reasonable way that people can amend any issues that have arisen because of data entry problems on the um, COS? So we'll have to wait and see how that pans out. Um, there is going to be a second service, which is going to be sort of a bigger service that is um, due to come online from the end of this year, which is the piece that will um, supersede, if you like, the current sponsor management system. So um, this sounds like it could be quite an exciting development for employers in terms of potential usability. Um, there's meant to be better functionality for um, notifying sponsor change of circumstances. Um, a, a dashboard that the employer can see all of their sponsored workers in one go um, and they should be also getting further action reminders that are not currently built 
into the system as we have it now. Um, and we'll have to wait and see what else it includes and whether or not this is useful for sponsors. Um, we don't know yet whether it's going to have any document upload capabilities um, because currently it can be a bit painful for sponsors to have to notify changes to their circumstances uh, because they have to send in hard copy documents to the Home Office by sort of fairly rudimentary measures. Um, and then it kind of gets lost in the ether and we don't really know whether the Home Office can then access that information easily at a later stage itself. Um, so um, also you need to go back to a very paper-based process if you get locked out of the system. And we'll have to wait and see whether the process um, in that regards is improved under the new system or it isn't. Um, and then the last thing that they are going to deliver from early next year is a new way of new sponsors being able to make their applications. So rather than having a submissions sheet and going through a fairly sort of um, email-based process or what was a paper-based process prior to the pandemic, um, there will be an online process that will be properly online. Um, and it will also include some data matching or cross-checking with other government department information, including HMRC and potentially Companies House. So that should reduce the documentation burden for new applicants for sponsor licenses. Um, and we'll just have to see how, how good those processes are and if they work seamlessly. Um, Home Office is planning to pilot their launch of these various things so um, they will be trialled with a limited group of users to begin with before rolling them out fully, which seems to be a sensible approach. Um, but it means that, you know, if, if bugs are found along the way, that these timelines for launch of things and, and um, development of them could slip. Um, so I think that hopefully the Home Office will have a, a decent feedback mechanism in the early stages of rolling these things out because, you know, it will more than likely be the case that there will be glitches along the way. Um, so I think stakeholder engagement is going to be really important because um, it is a very ambitious project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks very much. And just sort of, just to finally on the... Um sort of pr practical aspects do, do, moving to the application processes what do you think the, the biggest advantages and issues with digitalization of processes have been as they've evolved um well i think that it has gotten rid of some of some sort of quite serious problems that we've had in the past in immigration processes so for example, um, when we had paper-based forms, um, there was a period of time where we had a lot of trouble with applications being held to be invalid because of payment processing issues. And that caused all sorts of trouble for people's um, immigration status where they were trying to extend their permission in country. So um, with the online forms and the application fees going through as part of that process, as a digital process that's eliminated that problem, um, it can also substantially reduce processing times um, for some applicants because the people who are applying nowadays for electronic visas, they don't have to attend a visa application centre or um, Sopristeria uh, facility in country. Um, and there have been delays where those appointments for visa application centres are not immediately available. So that's also a good thing. Um, it can reduce the amount of documentation that people have to submit as part of their applications. Um, for example, where the Home Office is using interdepartmental checks. Um, and um, in the future, it could be that uh, some of those cross checks can be done more automatically with perhaps other providers like TB um, check providers or English language test providers or maybe um, ECTUS, for example. So that could be quite exciting um, in terms of lifting documentary requirements for people. Um, what about on the, on the downs, so just, just on the negative side? Well, yeah, briefly well, on the there, negatives. there are negatives <laughs> and there are a lot of negatives. And I think um, Luke and Darren will probably cover some of these um, as well. But 
Um, in terms of the processes themselves, it used to be the case that you could see all of the questions that the Home Office would ask you in your application by looking at their hard copy form. But now because the forms are interactive and it sort of leads you down a pathway, depending on what answers you make to particular questions, um, people may end up uh, not disclosing relevant information because they've answered the wrong question here or there and, and are not actually putting their application forward um, in full because of those sorts of mistakes. Um, and that can potentially, in the worst case, lead to them being accused further down the line of deception or you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and also where digitalisation processes are partially rolled out, like, for example, what we have at the moment with some people applying for e-visas and some people are applying where they're still getting a hard copy entry clearance vignette um, and having to have to go to a visa application centre. You know, some, some people are able to access those streamlined timeframes and processes and not have to worry about whether their vignette is going to expire before they travel and have to get it replaced again, um, whereas others still do. Um, and on the flip side, people who are using the e-visa application process, for example, sponsored workers, um, under the previous arrangements, when somebody's biometric residence permit was issued to them, they'd also get a national insurance number issued at the same time. But that sort of functionality for the time being has been broken um, mm. for people who are applying for e-visas. Okay. Um, and there is, a, is, is still a big problem with some um, third parties not even recognising electronic status, like mm. um, foreign governments who are expecting still to see a physical visa when somebody who holds an e-visa um, is applying for immigration status for their country so mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay well thank you um I and mean, we may uh, i'm sure I'll come back to you later on for some other things as well but that's very helpful thank you on that um moving on to the border now um we're going to speak or i'm going to ask darren um some questions about how the border has been transformed and sort of on a theme with what, what you were saying about um how some people are treated differently <laughs> according to to their nationality in terms of documents. I think that might be the theme here. Um, so Darren, um, the use of e-gates has been significantly expanded over recent years. As a practitioner, does this present concerns? Well, I think that the, you know, the use of e-gates and the attraction of e-gates for a border force and for the Home Office is clear because they can massively reduce the human resources required to deal with you know, the, you know, large numbers of visitors that come to the UK. I think that any practitioner, um, you know, who's, who's been doing the job for any length of time will be somewhat, you know, horrified by the lack of any physical evidence of a date of entry and perhaps the lack of any communication or notice which informs those that have entered of the conditions to which they're subject. And that's because, you know, whilst the e-gates are frictionless and very easy to use and very attractive for, for that reason, all of the underlying complicated and quite severe sanctions that exist for a breach of conditions still remain. And so you have a disconnect, in my view, between the communication that's given to someone who's entering subject to immigration control uh, and the quite punitive sanctions that could result if they were to breach those conditions. And we're now in a position where um, we have a BJ, uh, sorry, B5J SSK nationals, which is Australia, Canada, Japan, New Zealand, Singapore, South Korea, and United States. I used to remember what that acronym or, or I think it's not even it was, but I don't remember anymore. And also EEA and Swiss nationals can enter use, as visitors using an e-gate. And you can also use an e-gate in some circumstances when you've got prior into clearance or, or non-lapsing leave. And of course, that's granted then automatically subject to a variety of conditions, including you know restrictions on your right to work, time limits as to the duration of your stay. Uh, and it's an interesting thing as well that from uh, Border Force's internal um, documentation on this, how they get around the communication um, issue is to simply say that, you know, have signs that are pretty clear in, in, in sort of landing areas that say you can enter as a visitor for six months, you cannot work and you cannot access public funds. Now, any practitioner will know that the, the visitor's rules are much more nuanced than that. It's you, you can often work. You know, there's qu quite specific things that you can do and you can often be paid for that. And so it's an interesting, you know, dichotomy or disconnect between you know the complexity and nuance of the actual law and what's being communicated to people 
Now, to be fair, that problem has always existed. It's existed even when you had, you know, an in-person examination or meeting with an immigration officer. And we've all had disputes with immigration officers about what the visitor's rules actually say and what they, you know, what the extent of those rules is. But um, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's good on the one hand to have a light touch system. I can see the attraction of it, but it, it is of concern that this, you know, these quite punitive sanctions exist and their communications poor. There was an interesting uh, report on eGates by the Independent Chief Inspector uh, of Borders and Immigration, um, who I think is now David Neal, um, and it was discussing the addition of B5J SSK nationals and consequences of that, and you know, in terms of being able to utilize eGates. And those consequences were listed as being a drop in premium service income, increased NHS debt, decreased counter-terrorism referrals, a drop, a drop in refusals for that cohort, a lack of tracking of criminality for that cohort, and a perception of reduction in service to UK nationals using the gates. Now, the implication of that is clearly that decision-making has simply receded back. It's not that like this is a like-for-like -like replacement using automated systems. It's just that they've stopped caring so much uh, about that particular cohort. Whether that's a sensible thing, you know, they talk about referrals. A referral doesn't mean that there was, you know, terrorism issues. But, but whether or not, you know, the decision making is simply received back, I suppose, is going to, you know, be, be, be found out in the longer term. Mm. And sort of, sort of linked in. What about landing stamps? Um, there's often no record. There's no record now of entries for um, for these this cohort. Is there? Yeah, and that, that was something that actually came, you know, I came across as a practitioner, you know, sort of gradually where I started to see more and more types of people coming in and not having a physical stamp in their passport. And it wasn't something I'd actually been aware of, you know, before it was introduced. It simply, I became aware of increasing numbers of, of you know, for example, US nationals just not having a stamp. And I thought it was an, an omission at first. The difficulty, of course, with having no landing stamp or any evidence is that, I'm sure, again, anyone who's doing the job for any length of time will remember trawling through, uh, you know, a client's passports to try and work out their travel history for 10 years before you make an ILR application. Now, in many cases, that's not going to be available anymore, and you'll be relying either on their fastidiousness of keeping travel tickets or their memory. Now, there is, we did learn over the course of sort of the last few years that I think you can make a subject access request to learn from, I think, the advanced passenger information record about your, your arrivals. Um, and some clients do that. I mean, some clients will just have a guess about when, you know, they, when they come in. But of course, it can be very important in some cases for citizenship or for ILR. The, the, the precise number of dates that you have been absent from the UK can be the difference between a grant or a refusal of leave. So it can become very important. Uh, my uh, and my, you know, my colleagues may correct me. I don't get the impression that the Home Office routinely cross-reference travel history dates on an application with any information that they have. I just don't think that happens. But it doesn't mean, I think, that you could be blasé about that or cavalier about it. And, you know, you're always very worried about an allegation of deception where a material matter, if you were to guess dates, you know, I made an honest mistake about missing a trip somewhere and it had a big difference to your case. You would want to tread pretty carefully, I think. And I'm sure... Yeah, and I'm sure like we're talking about the the, the profusion of, of 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 initiatives that are going on. No doubt, um, they will in due course be able to track you know every exit and have it instantaneous. Or one would assume that in due course they would have that those that sort of information at some point, and, and we just don't know when that will be. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing, I would just what other examples of practical problems do you think that can arise from the use of e-gates? Well, I think there's a few things that can arise. The first one is obviously when you're not wanting to come in as a visitor, a standard visitor, you, you want to come in for a permitted paid engagement or as a as a temporary creative worker utilising the specific visa-free concession that exists. And, and being the geek that I am, I remember when eGates first came out, noticing there wasn't signage which directed people to say, I, I must actually approach an immigration officer, I should not use the eGate. And I have to say, you know, personally speaking, after a long flight with a really big queue of people with a, a nice gate that's letting you in, uh, the idea that you're going to put your hand up and, and try and seek an immigration officer when there, there often isn't anyone around and you're, you know, making a bit of a fuss must be quite difficult. But if you don't do that, of course, the gate, because you have no prior entry clearance, the gate will default into giving you visitor status. And you'll, if you carry on then to work, you know, um, as a, for example, a creative worker, you'll break the law. You'll not be got permission to do that occupation. Um, the other thing that can happen, obviously, is um, with uh, EU digital status, where they're coming in prior to the grant of um, the, 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 the entry being effective, and again, the, the, the danger of being defaulted as a visitor. There was some information, I think, um, from 
ILPA that, or an ILPA meeting that the Home Office would deal with these kinds of cases pragmatically and a suggestion by the Home Office that if you come in as a visitor and get, you were given automatic leave and then you had a digital status grant which was going to take effect in say a week or two's time, that would somehow override the visitor status just by operation you know, automatically. I don't think that's the case. My reading of the relevant provisions is that can't happen until you have to have formally vary that leave. Um, that may come in future. There may be changes made to the to legislative structure to allow that, but I don't. I'm not aware of a provision where you can suddenly transfer an automatic grant of visitors' leave into something else. Um, they say they're taking a pragmatic approach um, with it, but I mean a pragmatic approach would have to be a bit like what, what happened with the COVID concession, where people had missed their 90-day or 30-day entry vignette period. They had entered subsequent to that, but were permitted to to, to vary with a free. I mean, it wasn't described as an application, it was an email, but it was still an, an administrative act uh, and that's something that would have to be done. But you know, you're really just seeing a disconnect between lots of different things changing at once, different statuses, different systems, all kind of being thrown together, uh, you know, with, with physical grants of status, digital status, sometimes no status, automatic gates. It, it can all be a, 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 bit, of a, a bit confusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, and then just sort of looking forward, um, because this is all this this constant development and it's all you know the move to the digital border and so forth do you, what do you know about the electron electronic travel authorization scheme that that that, 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 that they're, the government are hoping to bring in well what i know is i mean there hasn't been a vast amount published on it i think i mean the most recent sort of document I've, i have seen i think uh, was maybe from february but it didn't expand much on something from the 24th of may which is about the, the new plan for migration um, but it's a, they say it's a phased program to 2025, introducing a uh, universal permission to travel requirement, which will require everyone wishing to travel to the UK, except British and Irish citizens, to seek permission in advance of travel. And it's a bit similar to things like ESTAs that you'll hear of you know, when you go into the US. It's intended to be um, uh, fully or largely automated, although complex or adverse decisions will be taken by a trained officer or caseworker. And basically it allows them to make, they say, um, security checks and pass on passengers and informed decisions at an earlier stage. Um, it's quite striking though, actually, the, the Nationality and Borders Bill contains provisions for the introduction of the, of the ETA. And it's actually going to amend immigration law at quite a fundamental level. It's going to amend the Immigration Act 1971. Um, and there's been lots of focus on the, the Nationality and Borders Bill in terms of changes to refugee law, you know, warranted focus, but there's an awful lot in that bill um, beyond, you know, things like refugee law. And Clause 71 talks about um, what, what will be used to bring in this ETA system. And it's going to be largely governed by the immigration rules. And it's interesting that, you know, the rules will, for example, um, they, they will require an individual of a description specified in the rules not to travel to the United Kingdom from any place, um, you know, unless they have an ETA. And it talks about how the rules will provide for the form and manner in which an application may be made for an ETA, specify the conditions that must be met, specify the grounds in which it must or may be refused, specify the criteria determining you know, periods of validity and things like that. And I think it's a striking similarity to actually the provisions regarding leave and in particular part nine of the immigration rules about you know, things like general grounds for refusal, this language of must or may. And so I think it, it's interesting to look at it almost as a kind of leave, you know, it's a kind of shift to actually quite a fundamental change which we're not we haven't really had before where there's a you know another layer of decision making similar to what we deal with with grants of entry clearance and leave to remain etc but but there's something quite different like i guess it, as you're saying it, it, it'll provide some kind of protection in a way for people who do uh, or who may unwittingly come to work when they shouldn't hopefully or one would think that this in this sort of new decision making you're talking about at that at that stage you, you you'd think that might be weeded out yeah, yeah i mean my my I, I have to say that's not in the terms of what they've said but you would hope mm. that and that's why I, I think i said to you before that all of this is quite at odds with some of the case law that's come out for example there's a case of anwar which now that was concerning leave to remain but about the importance of communicating conditions to to um you know, people who've been granted leave to remain and and the, the fundamental constitutional principle of doing that because if you're going to subject someone to quite serious, serious penal sanctions you want them to be very very clear that what what you know what those what those sanctions are and what the limits of their what the limits of their permission uh, you know is i'm not saying it's not lawful to do this because you know Anwar was concerned with the specific leave to remain, the immigration leave to enter and remain order does allow this 
you know, oral yeah. grant of leave and automatic grant of leave. But it, 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 it seems like to me not to be set easily or in harmony with that overall principle about the importance of communicating these kinds of things to people. Yeah. No, it's it, it, yeah. Thanks very much. That's really a sort of all change on on that side. And then, Luke, can we can we turn to you? Um, and what I was particularly interested in is sort of the EUSS experiences to date of digitalization. Um, and just looking before that, looking ahead, or, and perhaps behind as well in relation to this. From the big sort of question at the moment is from the sixth of April, um, as Catherine was mentioning, you know, um, BRC, uh, biometric residence permit holders and frontier work, worker permit holders are all going to have to start using an online portal to prove their immigration status in the UK with landlords and employers, as Catherine was mentioning. What, what is this and um, what problems do you think there have been and, and will be? Yeah, so I think the starting point in understanding what immigration status is going to be uh, and is for EU citizens living in the UK now and what will be for, for everybody else in the future is that it's a stark move away from having a card with your photo expiry and so forth and having it in your hand and putting it in your wallet or somewhere safe that the individual has control over and, 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 and some autonomy over. And what essentially is happening is, is we are completely moving away from that. People are essentially no longer having that physical autonomy over proof of what immigration status they have. And it's being placed behind a paywall, if you like. Um, an information wall is probably a better way of describing it. And but the, the future is now that for people to be able to prove their immigration status in the UK, is that they need to navigate something called view and prove. I think its name will probably change and um, evolve as, 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 as time uh, goes by, but that, that, is, that is what it is called at the moment. So from the 6th of April, everybody, um, in line with those documents that uh, Jonathan was just describing, as well as EU nationals already in the UK, um, who is already subject to this, this is a rolling out, um, they will have to use this view and prove portal to be able to navigate right to work and right to rent. So this portal, um, essentially you access it by the Home Office website. I'm sure some of you have seen it and used it, um, where you use the ID document that's linked to the status to access the portal after you go through various questions. You explain the reason why you want to use um, the portal who you want to share the status with, and then it produces a share code. And that share code is then used by the person who needs to make the decision, so be it the landlord, the employer, whoever, and they will then be able to go in and then view the status. So it's a multi-transactional point to be able to get through the process from beginning to end. It's not as simple as taking out your picture, somebody looking at it, comparing the picture to you and then making a copy of and retaining it. There is a whole now ecosystem of stages where things can go wrong, it can break and so on and so forth. And this is going to be rolled out, um, you know, fully um, from the six. Um, so what's the safety net to the problems? And I'll talk about the problems in a moment, but I think it's important to kind of understand the full sort of visual architecture of the view and prove service. Um, if you have an issue, if you have a problem, then the Home Office say you can contact a helpline. And this helpline at the moment is the EU settlement scheme, essentially, who you can contact and then they will then um, provide you with support on how to navigate it. And there's also a portal where you can report problems as well, but it goes to this, this same team. And this is all done with a, with a, with a particular helpline to navigate it. So what, what are the problems with this? Um, well, um, they are essentially broken into, into sort of three, three parts, I would say. But the first is the, the practical challenges, the, just the steps themselves and the, that if it breaks or if there's a system shortage. For example, we, 
we get regular reports of people um, where the system goes down or there is a there's, there's something wrong with the information that the home office has recorded and they're not able to get into the portal produce a code etc so there's these practical challenges that that cause a breakdown the second relates more to the the user so the user challenge so the individual who's trying to acquire their status and this obviously cuts across lines of digital exclusion and ability to navigate systems and so forth so again regular reports to us of people finding it difficult to access the website navigate the system and produce their status and the final cohort of sort of problems um, is the is essentially is the information challenge that we have. Um, there is a lot of ignorance about what this is and how this works. Um, it's not just landlords and employers. It's not just banks um, when they're opening bank accounts, and it's not you know just local authorities when they're making homelessness decisions. The touch points at which people need to prove their status is is endless essentially. And when we had our cards with our pictures on, there was almost a universal language in terms of people were able to sort of, okay, yes, this is the thing I need to use to, to understand immigration status and the immigration status somebody has. And as we transition away from that to digital status, there, there, need, there is a new knowledge base that needs to be built. So for example, um, when uh, we've had reports of people, um, when they've been trying to get mortgages, um, with, uh, with with lenders, lenders saying, we need to see your immigration status. And they go, well, here's a share code. And Barclays Bank go, what's this? What, what am I supposed to do with this? And it then produces this, this endless sort of saga in terms of then trying to get around the bureaucracy. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of this where, they'll, where the people will learn it and they'll figure it out um, and take years to do so. But I think there'll be a lot of misery and, and problems in the interim. So we... Um, we anticipate a lot of these issues um, before the scheme for EU citizens went fully live last year and we brought a judicial review claim which we refused permission um, on. And the reason, fundamentally the reason why we refused permission was because we didn't have the evidence base to support our concerns and the arguments around discrimination and, and other points. And um, as such, what we've been doing is gathering information and evidence since then of people's specific problems of accessing, viewing and proving their immigration status via um, our reported tool, which is on our 3 million website. Um, we've had hundreds of responses of people um, giving examples of their problems, which has been really, really helpful to build a picture, but also in our advocacy with the Home Office. Um, but what is clear um, is that the Home Office is doing this and they're doing this very quickly and they're not communicating it with the public in a very effective way. And they are not giving people a fund, essentially a backup in, in case this all goes wrong, because the only backup that they have is the telephone line. And we did a freedom of information request on the telephone line performance. And um, essentially, 44% of callers to this helpline, as an average over the, last, over the year of 2021, 44% were able to get through to a, uh, to, to a person. The remaining balance of people were disconnected and not able to get through and speak to somebody. So that's a significant number. That's hundreds of thousands of calls um, that have been disconnected to contact this, this, this resource. And I should say that this resource is not just for the helpline, it's also for the EU settlement scheme generally as well. So I just wanted to end on, on one final thing to say about View Improve, which is that it's, it's, not, it's not an identity document. Let's be very, very clear about it. It's not digital identity. Um, you step away from thinking that this is some kind of digitalized identity. It is not. It is confirmation of your immigration status via a portal. It, it is it, it, to, and because the two are very distinct. Digitizing of wallets, digitizing of ID um, is very, very different. It's much more user-centered and centered around the individual and their ID and their proof, and they have ownership of that. It's about essentially emancipating your identity into a digital sphere. This is the opposite. 
this is removing your autonomy and your ability to prove your status away from the individual and bringing it further into the control of the home office. Mm. Okay, so we, we are sort of <laughs> from April, it's going to be a bit uncharted territories. Um, uh, I Just in terms of the time we have left, a very short sort of period, I just wanted to ask you if you could very briefly, in two minutes, answer an extremely <laughs> big question. Um, one that I'm certainly very, or towards the ignorant side of the equation. What should immigration lawyers care about data protection and other data rights? It is a huge topic. Why? <laughs> but to say, to put it, to put it briefly, you just heard from from us saying these. This is the advancing of digital technology. Um, this is at a very primitive stage, really, really, really primitive when you compare it to digitizing in other areas and other sectors. The ambition is to roll this out in a much bigger way, more machine learning, more artificial intelligence, more cross-departmental data sharing, more cross-departmental private public the lot in terms of um, acquisition, acquisition of information. Decisions will be made during the course of this process and that will be rooted in a language of data rights and um, civil liberties and that, that cacophony of, of, uh, um, of, of, of very, very uh, untouched territory in the migration sector. Mm. So clients, client, there are going to be cases and there are going to be things along the way where these will present problems. It's not all about ease for the consumer. I'm sure a lot of it is about that. That's the vision ultimately. But like, we have to remember that the Home Office's job isn't a, just about facilitating people coming into the country. It's about protecting the bar borders and um, facilitating removal and deportation of people. So they have two functions. And this latter function um, is where, where I think there'll be some serious um, fights to contend with. So, mm. It's a it's a really really important area that people need to want be wise to, and I, I guess we've just even sort of practically within the immigration sphere, there's things like we've had the all the issues with tax returns and the the the, the, the cases on tax returns. I've got this sneaking concern about um, how the Home Office may not read salary information or, and all this sort of stuff that that Catherine was talking about correctly, and that there's always going to be going to need to be that right of reply. You know, if if you are um, if the Home Office reads something wrong, you know, that the Ballad Jigari case, you have to be able to respond to those allegations. But yeah, it, it, there's, I mean, there's so much in all of this area and we'll, we'll be um, no doubt returning to a, a lot of it. But that, that was super interesting. Thanks very much, Luke. Um, okay, so if we just move over to the um, Q&A um, for the last bit, and I will just open that up on my screen. Um, the first question, which or the, the question with the most number of it, what information does the Home Office system record and store for a person who enters via e-gates? I don't know. Uh, Catherine, did, did you want to answer that? Well, I think the answer to that is um, probably less than we think um, or that you would, would hope. So what it is at the moment is that, the you know, there's no sort of, real magic to the e-gates. How it works is that a person who is eligible to go through the e-gate, um, as long as they've got a biometric passport, they present their passport uh, to the scanner at the e-gate. Um, they take a digital image of themselves, which is then actually viewed by um, a physical person behind the control point. And so really all they're looking at is whether the information that's come up on the biometric chip from the passport matches the image of the person who has presented themselves to the gate. Um, and the checks that happen at the gate are, as I understand it, limited to the warnings index. So the, um, uh, the security system um, for uh, people who are considered to be flagged as security concern for entry to the UK. So. If that check is met, then the gates or those two checks, the visual check and the warnings index check um, are met, then the person will be allowed in. So if the person has 
entry clearance or leave to remain in a long-term category, then um, that will continue on um, because they um, still have extant leave under the leave to enter and remain order. Um, if they don't have that, then they will be considered again under the same order by operation of law to have been given leave to enter um, on the basis of coming in as a visitor. Um, so the information um, in terms of recording somebody's entry to the UK is limited to the advanced passenger information, which is a completely different system. It's not triggered by passing through the e-gate. Um, and that's where that information will be drawn from, the API um, information, if somebody makes a subject access request further down the line um, for their entries to the UK. Mm. So what the e-gates actually do, I think, is less than what a lot of people imagine that they do. Mm. Mm. And um, just sort of linked in, in with that um, question for, for Darren, do, do you... Do you think the Home Office have any concerns about people who enter as visitors via the e-gates in relation to frequent and successive visits? If it's if the, if the, if the, if it's so limited, what what they may have? It now the, the, the question is it now seems to be self-monitored for these nationalities, whereas others may be subject to uh, border force checks on the frequency of their visits. So that's a specific example, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's quite a quite a good question, actually. And of course, from what Catherine's saying is the indication is that there's no inbuilt facility for the e-gates to monitor that, you know, the frequency of visits or whatever. And it links back to, you know, the, the demise of, of an examination on entry where this kind of, you know, for example, repeated successive visits would come up, be picked up by an immigration officer, the person would be questioned as to that. But there's also an interesting difference between what is specified in the, in, in the immigration rules as regards permitted activities for visitors and intentions, whereas as compared to actual conditions you know, you're, you're, there are conditions which are imposed by law which a breach of which is, is, is an offense but there are also you know must you can do and cannot do within within the visit rules which are a bit different they're not quite the same as conditions or, or you know mm. attached to leave but i think no and i think it's it, it links into basically you know some of the confusion and of course we see that as well with people who and this is a common myth that there's a you know six months within any any rolling year period, which has never been a rule, but people think that it is, and some clients will try and you know micromanage their entry dates to, so as not to exceed that six months in any whereas in fact it's just frequent and successive visits. You know that's that's the rule, but you know it's very poorly explained and communicated. Mm. And, um, I think I think the issue is more when um, the e gates are not operating and somebody does come to be examined by an immigration officer that um, there is a risk that there will be a problem for these people who ordinarily use e-gates. And just another question, sort of practical question. What are the issues in doing um, IDV applications as a family unit where all members hold a, re hold a relevant ID document? Is this something you see changing soon? Does anyone want to answer that one? I'm not sure whether the question is asking about the availability for premium and um, super premium um, processing. So um, at the moment, people who are able to use the, um, the IDV um, app, the main applicant is able to get access to the, um, oh, sorry, the, pri the priority um, processing um, services. So um, the individual the individual's um, dependents cannot. Um, so I think that is, is one issue that the Home Office needs to decide if and when they are going to resolve that. And I think it will be down to their processing capabilities because I think something that is, is a serious issue at the moment across the board is processing capacity within the Home Office. And we've seen um, the Home Office having to have to prioritise and reprioritise particular types of casework um, because of reactive circumstances. So we've had the pandemic followed by um, the withdrawal in Afghanistan now um, with what's happening in Ukraine. And so the Home Office is having to have to increase their capacity um, and move caseworkers around from one area of their business to another. And where there are pinch points like this, what it means is that the Home Office also needs to um, reduce its 
ability to provide sort of speedy decision making in particular areas. Um, and I think at the moment um, it's not going to be easy for them to increase that capacity quickly. Um, so I think these these additional um assurances on processing times in particular are going to be hard for them to offer to people. So will I see it changing soon? Um, if that was the actual question uh, that was being asked, um, possibly not because of our current circumstances. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, I just uh, the next one I think would be good, good for Luke. Um, what avenues of support will be available for the increased digitisation, given it's already very difficult to access information and support from the Home Office in general? And I know you've mentioned the um, the helpline that never answers, but um, do you think the Home Office are going to um, sort of increase support going forward? So they do have We Are Digital, which is a, a service that essentially provides support to people with filling in applications without giving legal advice. Um, the viability of We Are Digital and its success is an enigma to me. Um, I've in the past tried to find out what their, their KPIs are, what um, their performance metrics are, how do they don't give immigration advice when they're completing immigration application forms for people, all of these very interesting things. Um, but beyond the that and beyond this, this helpline, this does tie very much with what Catherine is, is saying here about resourcing. Manning a helpline is expensive mm. um, and it is really time consuming. Now, we know that the use of View Improve has expanded uh, exponentially. It's just grown considerably. The last stats, the last quarterly stats are released on this. I think the, the use of the right to work check by profile views views during quarter four of 2021 was just over a million. Um, and so that, you know, there is error within that and how people navigate that error is, 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 is really, really crucial. So um, I think it's safe to say that um, at this moment in time, it's probably going to be, get, be under strain um, because the need to prove and also the need to complete applications is going to increase. It's not going to decrease. And um, I think it's, there are going to be, have to be some serious questions the Home Office is going to have to ask itself about resourcing this stuff. Um, either it changes tack or, or whatever. But I think for the time being, um, that's what we're stuck with. Okay, thank you. Um... Just looking down these questions. Um, my, here's what my experience is that someone with EU pre-settled status who has a pending application for settled status cannot use View Improve to prove their status in the meantime. Um, do we know, presumably it's about a certificate of application, do we know if the Home Office is working on this? So um, it's, this is again part of the, uh, opaqueness of how all of this mm. works but how it's supposed to work is that if you have a pending pre-settled status application and you're a I think if it's you're an EU citizen I think it might be everybody now but I'm pretty sure it was at one point then you should be able to log in and if you had pre-settled status before and it hasn't expired it should still be there on the system and you should still be able to use that as the means of proving your status. Um, if it's expired, then it should be a certificate of application digital um, thing and that you can access through the same portal. So, so it suggests to me in that question, something has gone wrong um, because if you have an EU pre-settled pre status uh, application pending, mm. um, then it should be you should be able to log in and view it, um, but it does. If I remember correctly, it does depend on the nationality and um, the point at which you applied. Okay. I think yeah. my understanding had been that if it wasn't showing in the way that you would hope, um, that you could contact the Home Office's helpline and get them to 
reset the system so that it will show the person's existing yeah. status rather than just showing that they have a pending application. But, you know, obviously that um, highlights the, the problem with call centres and having to have to use that as your default when something goes wrong. I mean, we, we are also aware that of um, someone who's made a pre-settled status application twice and has two records or had two yeah. records live on the system and I think that this is um, you know, a good example of where design of the system and the issues um, around that come to light once the system is in use. And I think this is only going to become a bigger issue as more people have e-visas. Um, because I think just, just to come, just to really punctuate on the point that you're making there, Catherine, because I think this is a really fundamental design flaw, is it's not rooted in an individual application number. It's not like the old home office reference numbers where you'd have M12 blah, 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 where that was a unique identifying number against a user. What we are talking about here is multiple unique application reference numbers. So they have no point to be linked to an individual. So you could, as exactly like as you've described, you could have multiple status documents associated with multiple different applications for various different points. And it becomes immensely confusing. And the only way to remedy this, and exactly the only way to remedy this, this problem is by engaging with the home office via their, their call center. Um, and yeah, it, 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 it's proving to be immensely problematic for people. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there is, is a long way to go in the design of these systems. Once these things are launched and they're new, um, I think some of the, um, the design of them is, is not fit for purpose. And it's only as people are using them and we start to see more of the problems emerge in practice that we're going to have to be pushing the Home Office to remedy um, the issues that we are seeing happen. Um, yeah. So, you know, in terms of having multiple um, uh, pre-settled status, um, the, this is something where, you know, um, the person is with a status that is um, a later status from the second grant. But for people who have other types of e-visa, um, it could be the case that the first grant is one that is a longer period than the next one. So we are going to see some really mm. massive problems in terms of people potentially ending up as being overstayers because they don't know which record is the right one and the, the live one, and nor will their employer or anybody else because they'll mm. still be generating share codes under whichever record. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a real problem. And I think that um, we're going to see more of these as more of the systems move on to mm. a digitalised framework. Yes. So uh, just um, thanks very much for that. Um, and then looking at the, the time, I think we're out. Um, but we raised a huge amount of issues. It's obviously going to be quite a journey that we continue to be on. Um, thank you very much indeed to the speakers. Um, the uh, webinar will be available to watch again um, after, the, um, after the event. And as I mentioned, we'll be sending um, a, a range of uh, materials um, to you all shortly. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.